Hello. Good morning. Wow, God speaking. Uh, I'm so encouraged by everything I've heard so far this morning. Uh, so, so here we go. Uh, it's uh, nice to say hello to you all. Hello up on the balcony there. The balcony, hi. Hi there, online. Good to see you too. And downstairs here as well. Hopefully that's given us all time to get the levels right and it all coming through. I'm not getting any uh, frowns from the sound there, so that's good. Right. Um, it's just a real privilege to be here to, to bring you something from God's Word this morning. Uh, I'm, 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 so, I'm so happy to be doing that. Um, we're going to be continuing our series on Abraham and Sarah, and now, as of last time, baby Isaac. And today, Hagar and Ishmael make a return to the narrative. We're also going to hear from an angel, from God himself, and for completeness, uh, a wife from Egypt for Ishmael, although that's the last time I'll be mentioning her. Uh, so let me read the passage through for you. It's Genesis 21, if you want to turn to it. And we'll be reading from verse 8. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. For the woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. God created animals and he created plants. That's a, what you would call a high level summary. Did you know that there are 1.2 million species of plants and animals that have been identified so far by humans? Scientists estimate that there are 8.7 million in total. And although I've got no idea how you count things you haven't found yet, knowing God, I can believe it. I can imagine that he's placed millions more plants and animals around the earth waiting to be found and identified and named by humans. Maybe this morning you're taking some of your notes in picture form. I know that some of you do. Uh, you might want to start with a, a picture of an animal. Uh, you could perhaps draw a, a dolphin like we saw in the countdown there, or a lion like we sung about. Or maybe you just want to draw a brown marmorated stink bug or something. Or you might want to draw a plant. You might want to draw a nice sunflower or a big tree. Uh, or maybe a pink wax cap mushroom. I don't know. I'll leave you to start drawing. But why am I talking? Why have I pulled out these fascinating facts for you? Well, hopefully it's to it illustrate that if the high level summary of what we're gonna to consider today is God's promises, which we've already been hearing a lot about, and God's provision, then, we're, then, then the ways in which he provides are in millions of little different ways. We're gonna see from this story that Every person faces challenges, complex, multiple challenges in this story. And God's continued since then until now to work in lives all over the world, all through history. He's worked in millions of lives in different ways. 
but we know that he's, he's motivated by his love for us, his children. And his father's heart, his pure love for his children, he makes promises and then he provides for us. So we can zoom out and say God created animals and plants or zoom in and say God created the brown marmorated stink bug and the pink white cat mushroom and all the rest. We can zoom out and say that God makes promises and God provides. And we're now going to zoom in a bit to this passage and see that God makes promises to Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. And he provided for each of them, and Isaac and Ishmael, in, in a kind of variety of different ways. And so along the way, we'll be able to consider what it means for ourselves to live within this framework of God's love. And, uh, uh, and, and be reminded again, as we already have been so far, of his promises. And have our eyes opened, hopefully, to many, his many varied gifts of provision. So let's start with Sarah. What's going on with her? Well, we're three years on from uh, where Ben left us uh, with Sarah laughing with joy at the birth of her son Isaac. So he's three. Ishmael, he's now 17-ish, and he's mocking and persecuting Isaac and Sarah. Sarah's responding to this as a kind of threat. She's in fighting mood. We know that Sarah along with Abraham, had great promises from God to have offspring outnumbering the stars and sand. It's difficult to imagine that Sarah has forgotten either the multi-year challenge of holding on to that promise in the first place or, or the joy of the provision that was making her laugh, like we were looking at last time. Yet at this moment, we seem to be seeing kind of some more human frailty, uh, harshness and defensiveness, uh, a lack of compassion from Sarah. But yet also, there's this kind of attack from Ishmael to Isaac, the child of the flesh to the child of the promise. Sarah's God-given instinct in this moment is to protect the child of the promise and eject the child of the flesh. So yes, this is the solution God has provided in his wisdom. He gives Sarah the plan and, and she shares it with her husband Abraham. God affirms the plan to Abraham. We've seen it there in the story. So we can identify that even though Maybe you, like me, feel a little bit uncomfortable about Sarah's actions. We can see that that's what God wanted in that moment. We'll come back to Sarah. Abraham. Where's Abraham at this, in, in, in this story? So the first time we, we sort of, uh, uh, he's spoken of in this passage is that he's greatly distressed. Again, he's got this promise of a multitude of offspring, and he's got two sons. One's three, one's 17. There's not really any prospect of any more. That, that, that ship sailed. Um, he hasn't got another promise that God's going to miraculously give him another one. So he's just got the two. And, uh, and here he's, the suggestion is that he maybe sends one off into the desert, probably thinking losing one, uh, cutting his chances or the number of potential descendants by 50% in one fell swoop. Now, God, now, Abram's known God's provision in, in so many ways. We've been looking at that week on week, how God keeps providing for Abraham. But this isn't a moment for him to just rely on that past experience or some previous formula. God's provision is, is changing. There's a new provision in this moment. And uh, in this moment, it's an unusual one. It's a wife with an idea uh, to send the other wife and the other son out into the desert. Strange stuff. Abraham there, what a difficult decision. Yet he knows God's spoken, God confirmed it. And Abraham walks with God. He's been reminded of the promise. I will make him, Ishmael, into a nation also. He's got that promise affirmed again by God. So hearing him, hearing God afresh for himself and through his wife, God gives him faith and he trusts Ishmael's life to God sending Hagar and Ishmael into a, a perilous situation. Some food and water, only enough to carry, maybe just enough for a few days. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of uh, taking my daughters to university, um, sending them to the, the desert that is a, a campus, uh, or uh, perhaps um, maybe packing them up with a few freezer meals and a, a quick uh, basket from a whiz around the local co-op. And thinking that that will uh, maybe keep them alive till Christmas. 
completely forgetting that uh, as soon as they get there, someone in their flat's going to just raid their fridge and eat it all. Um, maybe you've got an experience of sending a child off to a camp or an expedition or uh, uh, some sort of club and, and wondering, will they be all right? Will they be safe? Will God look after them? We've got this real comforting uh, expression in there, haven't we, at the, at the end. God, God was with the boy as he grew up. Just one more way in which we could imagine that this is God's provision for Abraham in this moment. Uh, if we were to peek ahead to chapter 22, we'll see that Abraham was tested again in the area, uh, this time uh, trusting Isaac to God. And uh, maybe this is a bit of a practice, a bit of, step of, a, bit of a step towards that, uh, uh, a, a practice run for him uh, for when he has that moment to trust Isaac to God in an unimaginable situation. Okay, Hagar and Ishmael then. Let's look at them. We last encountered Hagar in chapter 16, and we were looking at that a few weeks ago, and we remember that Hagar at that point was out in the desert. She was still pregnant with Ishmael at that point. Um, and the angel that came to her then promised that she would have descendants too numerous to count via Ishmael. She also gave some other details about what Ishmael would be like as he grew up. And so, but, but at that time, the angel sent her back, sent her back into the camp, back to Abraham and Sarah to get looked after there. So, so there we see like there's a provision for, for Hagar and really for Ishmael, uh, a safe place to be born and grow up. But now they're part of the conflict that's in, as, as we read on, that leads to the breakup of the tent. Again, it's a bit complicated, isn't it? It's a bit uncomfortable, it's a bit messy. In some ways, we could look at Hagar and Ishmael and say, well, they're real victims here, aren't they? They have no power or influence in their, in their family set up there. Um, but then we also see that they were kind of aggressors, mocking uh, and persecuting Sarah. We could look back to the promise that Hagar got from the angel, which said that he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So again, in some strange way, this is an example of God's provision. Maybe not the suggestion that you or I would have uh, put him, uh, gone to in, in that moment. Maybe we would have said, uh, oh, come on kids, just play nice together. Uh, you know, let's not talk about this, just, uh, just look after each other. Come on, let's, let's not talk about this too much. Let's just uh, keep going. But no. This is God's plan. So as the story moves on, Hagar and Ishmael, out in the desert, run out of food and water. They reach this desperate, desperate place, sobbing, no hope at all. Then as sure as God has led them to that place, he leads them to another place. He hears their cries. The angel speaks, God opens their eyes opens her eyes and gives her not just a skin of water, but gives her a well of water now. And as we've seen, God remains with Ishmael as he grew up. That's our God. That's our God. And that's some of the ways, at different points, he provided for Hagar and for Ishmael. So Abraham and the others are all on a, a journey. God is faithful to his promises and as we see the great variety of the detail of his provision for them, do you ever think for yourself, oh, it, it, it's, it's just about cracking the formula, uh, finding all the keys, getting life all sussed, solving every problem, and then just carrying on with everything in a, in a living the perfect Christian life after that? I can find myself sometimes thinking like that. But we've got to embrace this reality that life is truly a journey and a fairly unpredictable one at times, isn't it? And that just speaks to how life is designed to be lived in a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus. It's a life of being led day by day, a step at a time, being extravagantly loved by a heavenly father. It's a life to trust to Jesus every single day, his mercies are new every morning. And it's a life that we live trusting our families and our friends 
our neighbours to him as well. It's a life to be lived through changes, through testing, through waiting. It's a life to be lived holding on to the promises God has given us. Wherever they came from, through our dreams, through our spouses even there, it says, you know, through our church family, a life of receiving provision from God. So promise and provision. What promises does God have over your life? What chapters are currently being written into your story by God? What provision is God got for you today as we look at this part of his word? So what I'm going to do now is go back in reverse and look at these, look at our ensemble of characters here. So, starting with this time with Hagar and Ishmael. Are you desperate? Are you broken? Are you out of your own resources? Are you overwhelmed? Are you sobbing? If so, you're not the first and you're not the only one to find yourself in that place. We see Hagar came through that. So can we. John records these words of Jesus. In fact, it said Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. That's the promise for those of us that will cry out to Jesus. He'll open your eyes. And he'll place a well of life inside you. Whether it's your first time or your umpteenth time, just do it. No one, can't, no one can do it for you. You've got to come. Be bold, like the writer to the Hebrews says. Let us approach this throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time and of need. What Graham, what Fiona was saying, that that's what Graham was experiencing for six weeks, lying in a hospital bed. I imagine what, maybe not finding it easy to think, yes, this is God's provision for me right now. God's with him. Like Abraham, are you distressed about others? His distress was for Ishmael and Hagar. Are you worrying about your children? Or like Fiona, your husband? Does that distress you, seeing hurting people? God's word to Abraham isn't, oh, just don't care about them. But it is the word of God here. He says, don't be so distressed. Do you need that reassurance today? But it's not down to you to carry God's level of responsibility to care either for yourself or for your children, for others. If we try and carry God's responsibility for ourselves or for others, we'll burn out. God doesn't give us instructions to overprotect ourselves or overprotect others. In fact, quite the opposite. He explicitly says, do not worry about your life. Your father knows what you need. So let's remember this promise and let's return our, our expectant gaze to him, knowing that he will guard your life, your children's life, your family, your husband in hospital for six weeks, your friends, the community. This doesn't mean you don't serve people, don't tell them about putting hope, their hope in Jesus too. It brings you to a place where you can actually model something to them you can usually the best thing you can do is, is be an example to them of showing what it means to trust in God when facing circumstances joyous or challenging you, you can still show them acts of love and mercy and grace but without any weird sort of savior complex or human pride uh, throwing you off I, again Jones testimony so encouraging isn't it how uh, how, how, how it's a uh, it comes down to, I find it, sorry, that, that it's encouraging in the way that to see them trusting God in complex, difficult and challenging circumstances encourages us that that's what we can do as well. Okay, lastly, but possibly most importantly, what about Sarah and Isaac? 
I say most importantly, given Paul's reference to this story in his letter to the Galatians. We're going to turn to that together. So let's go to Galatians, chapter 4. I'm going to dip in that. In verse 24, Paul explains that he's taking these things figuratively. He says, the two women, that's Sarah and Hagar, represent two covenants. And then just to pick up from verse 28. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So as we look back, with the help of Paul, it turns out that this was a foundation-building moment in Scripture. God was establishing how we become children of God. Children are born. Very profound, I know. But we didn't enter the kingdom of God by being born of the flesh. We entered the kingdom of God by being born again, by being born of the Spirit, and as a result of God's promise. So Jesus, again, his words recorded by John. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. The Father wills it. You, when you believe in Jesus, Jesus gives you salvation, and it can only be received as a gift. For those of us that are children of the promise, brothers and sisters of Isaac, who are putting our trust in Jesus, he goes on with a clear instruction and encouragement as to, as to how we can continue to live totally in that grace. Right now, we're in a hybrid service. We've got people watching online. We've got people watching in the room. You could even get YouTube out and watch in the room while, watch online while you're in the room. Uh, it's hybrid. It's both and. It's been good for us. It's so helpful for those that can't get here yet uh, or can't be here today to be able to watch online. This is, this is a, a good both and. Cars, just a, a car example for you here. Uh, you get petrol, diesel cars because of, because of the, the state of the climate. Uh, there's a bit of a transition going on amongst cars, isn't there? Petrol and diesel cars are starting to be wound down and electric cars are, uh, are increasing in number. And at the moment, in the middle, we've got hybrid cars. Got a battery and an engine. Both and. Hybrid. Wonderful. You get to feel like you're single-handedly saving the planet uh, whilst uh, not having to suffer from rain anxiety. It's a good both and. These examples, uh, I think, you know, show us that, that, that whilst hybrid can be a good thing, uh, you know, sometimes you're able to, to choose both, aren't you? But that's all maybe also not actually making a choice. And this is a great option if you're bad at making decisions, or you like to keep your options open, or you like desserts in particular. Stay with me. The expression always both is just too strong. Even Mike recently softened his, that, his favourite saying to almost always both. There's also a time where we do actually have to make choices, where the options are mutually exclusive, where we let go of one thing so that we can take hold of the other. We embrace one and in doing so cut off the other. For example, I couldn't call myself a vegetarian if I still eat meat just doesn't work. You can't be both end. I can't say that I've received a gift if I then start making regular repayments to the person who gave me that gift. It just doesn't work. And here we have God declaring through Sarah that in this case, hybrid is not an option. Derek Kidner in his commentary, puts it really well 
as we look at well, why was Sarah actually saying this? You know, I, I mean, we're looking forward to, to Paul uh, hundreds of years later re referencing back what Sarah said. Yeah, is that what Sarah meant at the time? Uh, maybe not. Um, and in that sense, Sarah, as Derek Kidna puts it, Kidna puts it spoke more truly than she knew when she said, get rid of the slave woman and her son. You can't have a, a combination of promise and of flesh. You can't have lots of grace, but just a few works as well. You can't mostly live in freedom, but on certain issues, just carry on with a legalistic approach because I'm struggling a bit with that. You can't freely receive, but now work on paying it back by trying to add some of your own works in. And you can't know that you've been made righteous, but then carry on thinking about yourself or about others for that matter, that, well, not quite making the mark, really need to do better. No, these things are presented as mutually exclusive. And as God says, listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So hopefully the question now is not, should I get rid of the slave woman? Should I get rid of legalism? When might I get round to it? Shall I leave that for another day? Can I be bothered at all to change it? Can I just accept this is just how I am? I'm just staying like this. I think the question now really is, is that's dealt with. The question really now is how do we get rid of that legalism in our lives? Well, I'm going to point you at Galatians. I find Galatians, reading the whole of Galatians a, a massive help as Paul takes you right through it. Um, I've, I've obviously referenced Galatians already. There. I've not got time to read you the whole book, although I'd love to. Um, maybe that's something you could do this week. Uh, I'd, I'd encourage that if you can find an hour to engross yourself in the story of grace through Paul's eyes. Grace alone. So just anyway, yeah, just a couple of verses. Uh, verse, verse, chapter 5, verse 16. So, so I say, this is Paul saying, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. So you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What he's saying is we don't defeat legalism if we just focus on behaviours. If we start, if we carry on sort of totting up, am I doing all the good things? Am I not doing the bad things? There we go. I've ticked this list. I've ticked that list. I'm living to please God. No, we get rid of that slave and their son by turning our attention to God's provision that is being filled with the Holy Spirit and walking by the Spirit. It's then that the desires of the flesh diminish and die. It happens on the inside. Fruit follows. Change happens on the inside. This is where we started, isn't it? When we came to faith, when we came to Jesus, we recognised our utter need of a saviour. We didn't bring anything then. We were saved by grace alone. And as Paul says, we must continue to live in that grace. Whilst it's important for each of us to consider whether we're continuing to live in grace in our individual walks of faith, it's also important to remember that we are also a body of believers, a church family here, collectively on a journey. Our lives aren't static, neither is church life static. We're supposed to be a people on the move. Things are supposed to change. Lockdown brought us huge changes. Unlock is bringing more. So we could also ask ourselves, what is God promising to lead us into as a church? And what will the provision look like? You've heard prophetic encouragement recently to get ready. We know we're called to go into the world and make disciples. What's it going to look like for us? Ginny's word about those, uh, those ducks that Stuart and Ginny have been observing on their walk, like a family. We've been given to each other. We're moving at maybe slightly different paces in slightly different styles, but we're moving together. We're supposed to uh, keep working together 
to keep moving forward. That's what God's doing in us. So to zoom out one last time, we see God's promise and provision to enable us to continue to walk in grace is the Holy Spirit. That's his gift. To zoom back in, walking in step with the Spirit is a living and active an exciting thing. It has a million different outworkings as individuals and as a church. So I'll finish with this, if the band want to get ready to come back up. I want to exhort us just to be full of expectation, knowing that God knows what's coming next. As an individual, as a church, God knows what is going to come next in your life. Let's, let's, let's be full of wonder, wonder-filled expectation at what provision he's prepared for us, because he has prepared it. We may be yet to know what it looks like, but he has prepared it. He will provide. That's his promise, and he will provide.